entertaining, informative, and educational. Inspiring content that makes a difference. This is the Maximus Choi Publications Broadcasting Network. Join the Academy. The Breeders Academy proudly presents Bread to Perfection with Kenny Troiano. A show for serious breeders. Whether you are looking to create a new strain or simply improve an old one, you have come to the right place. Daddy, I want more chicken. <laughs> oh, boy. Now, here's your host, Kitty Triano. Well, hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of Bread to Perfection. My name is Kenny Troiano, and this, my friends, is the podcast devoted to helping you become a better breeder and taking your strain to the next level. That's right, my friends. It doesn't matter if you are brand new to breeding or you've been breeding for many years. There is something all of us can do to improve our fowl for future generations. So stick with me a little while longer, because we're going to have a rootin', tootin', shootin' good time. <laughs> Okay, welcome to another episode of Bread's Perfection. I'm Kenny Troiano, founder of the Breeders Academy, and I'm here with Nancy, my wife, and co-host Frank Bradley. What's going on, you guys? You and Nancy are married? I've suffered 40-something years. <laughs> It'll be 41 in July, dearest. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long time. Tell me about it. <laughs> How many marital spats? Talk about marital spats. I thought I had one in the chicken pen. Looked in my pen as I was feeding, and this hen, her feathers are sticking out all in different directions. She looks like hell. But they're eating together like they're not having any problems. I'm thinking, would they have a marital spat with each other? So I don't know what the it's, heck happened. It's probably the opposite. I mean, it's not a spat. It's just they're really attracted to each other, and that's the reason her feathers look like that. She's had a bad hair morning, I guess. I was telling Kenny I had a walk pen, and I had seven or eight real nice brown and red pullets in it. I just had a young stag put him in there. And I got to noticing one pullet had no feathers on her back. She looked awful. I told Kenny, I said she looked like she had been wadded up and shot out of a shotgun barrel. She just looked awful. But he picked her. That's the only one that he would even mess with or fool with. The others looked like a new penny, nice feather, nice plumage, all perfect. They'd walk around and he wouldn't offer to bother them. He'd just pull it. That was it. Time to take her out. Let him pick on some others for a while. <laughs> you know what I mean? Actually, that's what I done. Yeah. That's what I done. But I didn't notice him single any out after that. Let's got it out of his system. Yeah, because yesterday she was fine. I don't know what the heck happened. So I took him out, put him with another hand. He didn't seem to be rough with the other hand, so I don't know. We'll find out. I'll probably go out there and <laughs> see that new hand all messed up too. But it was just all of a sudden. It was the weirdest thing because they've been together for a while. I don't know. She'd had enough. Hey, I've had them do that, especially you take a young bull stag. I've had a hen in with them, say, six months to a year, and they get along fine. And then you go up there one day, and he's beat the crap out of her. I have no idea why they do it, but they do. My birds were originally from Colonel Gibbons, and when I first got them, the cocks were really rough on the hens. I had to really watch them. It's like you put a hen in there, or you put him with a hen. He wouldn't beat the crap out of the hen at first, but then after that, they were fine. It was like the initial meeting, he had to show her who was boss, mm -hmm. beat the crap out of her for a little bit, and then everything was fine. And it uh, sucked for a better temperament, and it got better. Tony had the same birds I had when we first started, and he still has them. There's two things Tony would always ask me every time we talked. Are you seeing duck toe on your birds? Which I did at one time, I don't anymore. And asking me how aggressive my cocks were to my hands every time. So I don't know if he still has an issue. I haven't talked to him in a little while. But those were the two things he'd ask me every time we talked. I think a lot of times what you said earlier, I think breeding for temperament has a lot to do with it because I've noticed a lot of my birds have got more docile with the hens. The more gentle they are with me, seem like the more gentle they are w with the hens. Now, if I take uh, 
a young stack, I'm careful about putting any tight pins in with them. And if I do it, I want it to be a big enclosure where they can get away from them. But that's the only thing I got to watch. The younger birds, you've got to watch because they're inexperienced. They don't have any patience. And when the hen won't submit to them, they do what comes naturally. Mother Nature sets in and he tries to teach her lesson. Sometimes they go too far. He didn't even give her a chance to decide whether it was a good thing or not, because he was charging her the second he hit the ground and whipped her butt. And then it was over with. I'd check him every day. They'd be fine. Every now and then I'd get one that would shuffle a hen and she just knocked her out. Didn't kill her, just knocked her out. And she yeah. was out for a while and then she woke up. That cock came out as fast as I could and out he went, gone. I, I don't tolerate that. Yeah. That's the reason that a lot of times the older hens, you can tell an older hen, they do not run from them. They do not reject them in any way. They just lay down and put the wings out and say, let's get it over with, and that's it. But a young pullet, she's all over the pen running from them, screaming her head off, and that just makes it worse for the cop. That just makes it worse when they do that. But I also don't like the hens that sit up on the roost, don't want to come down. So my pens are set up so that I can actually take the roost out. I'll fix her. That roost is coming out for a few time. days, and then I'll put yeah, it back I, in. I, when I do that. I'll pull the roost out, and once they become familiar with each other, then I'll put it back in. But like you say, you take some hens and put them in with a, a new cot that they're not used to. They'll go up on that roost, and they'll sit there, and they won't come off to eat, drink. I've had them actually get them out, and they lost a lot of weight, dehydrated, and starved to death. Yeah, that can be a problem. Sometimes the rooster doesn't even give her a reason to do that, and she stays up there. No. And like you said, she will starve to death up there. That's the live or die Mother Nature put in them to protect herself at all costs. Here's my question. Maybe she just isn't attracted to him, <laughs> and you need to change that rooster out and give her someone she's more attracted to. You've got something there, Nancy, and I'm going to say it. People may laugh at me. And a lot of people said chickens for a long time knows what I'm talking about. A lot of people says the weed hatches were my best birds ever. And I think a lot of that is because I'll have several strings out on my yard and I'll have a half a dozen cocks out on strings. There'll be a particular hen come up to that cock and she will roost on the pen with him. She stays right there with him. She takes to him. And I think a lot of times that's the reason the birds come out much better because they're actually choosing one another. But a lot of people, I've heard them say it day after day. I wish I knew how these chickens were bred because it's some of my best birds that I don't even know how they're bred. They're weed monkeys or weed hatch or whatever you have it. But I think a lot of that is the hen actually choosing the cock. But the problem with the weed monkeys, <laughs> I guess you'd call it, is you don't know where they came from. And the best no you can do with them is pick the best from them and make them your seed fowl and start over and hope that their breeding is in line enough that you're not going to have the kind of genetic diversity you're going to have to weed through. That's the problem without selectively breeding them, put them together and making the choice yourself. You're forced to take birds that have a lot of variation that you may not want. That's going to take that's a long true. time to fix. And even though those birds are good, it's going to be tough to make a family out of them sometimes. But one thing I have noticed, especially in the spring or late fall, you'll have these big, nice stags, especially if they're straight-headed, the big, bright red combs. You put one of those out, and you put another 20 cocks out, and the majority of hens will go to that one with that big red comb every time. I never did really believe that until I saw it with my own eyes. Oh, no, I believe it. And yeah. one of the reasons we have, see, our birds, especially the game fowl, they're sexually dimorphic, especially in color. And one of the reasons that happens is because of sexual selection. Uh, the jungle fowl, too. Whenever you see birds where the male is different from the female, that's basically sexual selection at its best. That's the hen picking the male and determining what direction they go from there. It could be color of feather. It could be size. It could be comb size. It could be the crow itself. It could be all kinds of stuff. The difference between Mother Nature and us is we're selecting the birds. We decide who's going to mate to who. Kenny hit the nail on the head. Don't select ugly because the hen will run for its life. What she thinks is ugly, we may think is beautiful. So That's maybe true. the hen's head isn't right. You know what I mean? Maybe she's not thinking square. That's true. But now, <laughs> a lot of times, especially if you're just now pairing them up, it takes three or four weeks for that hen to really come around to that cock if they do at all. 
Because like Kenny said, some of them will just get on the roost and they'll literally starve themselves to death rather than let that rooster even come close to them. And then you throw one in, they automatically get alone. I've seen it every way. And some of them just won't allow certain roosters to touch them. I've seen hens where they did that. And no matter what rooster I put in it, they just weren't going to have any of it. That's true. So yep. Especially a yeah, pullet. Oh, man, it doesn't matter what type of rooster. If it's a pullet, they're scared to death. They're screaming and flying all over the pen, you know, running into things, trying to kill themselves. And they're just not having it. But usually a, a mature hen, she's got it all figured out. And usually there's not any problem if it's a mature hen. Okay. I want to welcome some of our new members. we got quite a few new members. Make sure to check out the Start Here pages. There is a lot of information in there, so don't try to absorb it all at one time. If you need any help, let me know, and uh, I can walk you through some of it. There's a lot of great programs and courses that you can check out. The Start Here pages is your best bet. And once you've been in there for a while, you get to know the website, get to know how the website's laid out get to know some of the programs and courses. If you need us to do coaching calls, we can. I just would rather you be in the website for a little while before we do it. So for the members, at the end of this show, meet us in the Breeders' Academy for the uh, Breeders' Roundtable. Uh, and gonna... what will we be talking about in yeah. the Breeders' Roundtable tonight? And Nancy didn't do her job. <laughs> <laughs> I was supposed to bring up the banners? Oh, shoot. I don't Maybe know. I would marital dispute going on here all i know is i'm supposed to start the ticker tape parade frank there's a few things i tell her every time before the show you're handling the banners don't talk over us do this do that i waste my no. time i'm telling you i don't know why i tell her anything <laughs> now man does this way if i tell her she forgets or she doesn't do it now if i don't tell her she'll go on and do it and i won't have to open my mouth Okay, yeah. I can talk now. Everybody's quiet. <laughs> I'm not allowed to interrupt or talk over anybody. You don't tell me about the banners every time. You just tell me not to interrupt. See, that's how much he hears me. What are we going to be talking about in the round table? You didn't answer my question. The one we've been trying to talk about for the last couple of weeks, but we've been having issues. I think we've got it all ironed out. Frank, by the way, is your Wi-Fi off? Televisions are completely blank screened and the iPad is on idle and the telephone is as well. So the only thing that's getting any juice to it is a laptop. So yeah. we're good shape. Last Monday, we did a system check and then a Q&A at the same time. We think we got ironed out. I didn't see any major issues. So I think we're good to go. So now we can get back on track to do the, the members round table after the show. This one's going to be clone worthy. How do you know if your bird is worthy of cloning? So we're going to talk about the different criteria that makes up the kind of bird that you want to uh, replicate. And there's a part of the Founders Program that allows you to do that and shows you how to do that. So we're going to talk about that. I'm really liking the different topics we have lined up for the members roundtable. The front end is more of a conversation. I basically have a topic. We're going to cover some things, answer a few questions. Like this outline I have today, it started out very simple. Just pecking away and working on it and expanding it. I told Tani yesterday, I was looking it over, I'm going, holy crap. This went from an easy 45-minute show to, have you seen it? There's no way we're going to cover no. all that. It's really good stuff. And I told Tani that. She goes, you're going to have to make multiple parts. Front end, like I said, I enjoy the conversation, talking about breeding, just go wherever the conversation takes us, answering a handful of questions. So if, if we're doing that and we're finding a way to get people excited about becoming breeders, because although you put two birds together, I don't think you're actually breeding. If you're going to get serious about breeding, we're, we can teach you that inside the Breeders Academy. We have a lot of good programs. Here, I'll do this for Nancy. So make sure you join the Breeders Academy today. And as a member, you're going to get the Members Roundtable, the Master's Class Video Series, the Founders Program, which I think is the best program on creating, improving, and maintaining a strain there is, the programs and courses that support the Founders Program are members' resources. We also have the daily articles, and we're adding new and improved content weekly. You want to do the next one? I just want to know if you can do it. <laughs> I had my cursor on that banner. Okay, next one. I was ready. Okay, next make, one. Here we go. Make sure to join our Breeders' Bulletins, which are our newsletters. There you're going to get some free tips and articles on breeding, free ebooks on breeding. Just go to www.breedersacademy.com to subscribe. You'd be glad you did. That's the first step to joining the website.
We'll be right back after a word from our sponsor. This show was brought to you by the Breeders Academy, where we will help you to increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and help you to improve the quality and performance of your fowl. As a member, we'll provide you with the roadmap that you will need to create a true family or strain. I urge you to check it out. You've got nothing to lose and you can cancel at any time. You also have a 30-day money-back guarantee. Simply go to www.breedersacademy.com to sign up. The Breeders Academy will not only change the way you think about breeding, but improve the way you breed your fowl. I hope to see you there. So let's get started. with the show like I said this is going to be a fun one Frank I always gravitate to topics that are fun to talk about I guess you could say that cover many aspects of breeding it's hard for me just to pick one little thing and pick it to death I like to take one top and expand it into many topics so we're covering a wide range of things so like I said this one kind of got away from me a little bit. So we're probably going to make multiple episodes with this, which I think is going to work out just fine. But the topics we do cover inside the Breeders Academy for the members roundtable are very specific topics because they're topics that we go in depth in. It's heavy into the breeding methods, breeding programs, how to actually get the most out of your birds. I like the topics on the back end because of how deep we go into the topic itself. Because I come up with different topics. I have to think to myself, okay, the topic on the front has to be more of a conversation, something fun to talk about, but yet the back end has to be something that's worthy of the members. More and, educational. Yeah, more educational, more scientific. And sometimes I create these topics and I go, no, I can't put this on the front end. This is a members type topic. So I end up making more of those than I do the front end. So I'm hoping this one will actually last a couple episodes. Saw it. I thought I was in the members. I thought I was in the members that court so long. Yeah. And I thought, I wonder if he's thinking we're going to do all this tonight. <laughs> I got myself in trouble with this one because it's just too big. But it'll be fun to talk about. And today we're going to talk about the things you can do to improve your success as a breeder. And I look at these as the pillars of success. These are the kind of things, if you look at some of the most successful breeders out there, these are the common denominators that they all do. We've talked about some of these many times. Some of them we haven't talked about in a while, so we'll go in deep on those. But it'll make good conversation, and if you guys have any questions or any comments, feel free to put them in the comments, and Nancy will bring it up, and we'll talk about it. It'll expand the conversation, make it even better. Do you so, want them to be on the topic, though, right? Yeah, stay on topic as much as possible, because if we're all over the place, then it's just going to feel like we're not covering anything. So True. But uh, the successful breeders, they often have certain key characteristics and practices in common. And a handful of them here that we can talk about first, and then we'll go into the eight areas of breeding that I actually think will improve your results. So I got to split up into different categories. So the first one would be knowledge and expertise, Frank. They got to have the knowledge and expertise to be a breeder and to produce good, solid strains. They've got to take all that in. They've got to educate themselves. It's just like this. Just because a mechanic's got every tool, to work on your vehicle with, and he doesn't have the knowledge, still not going to happen. You can have every tool available to you, but if you don't have that knowledge on how it's done and how to do it, then no sense of even starting if you don't have the knowledge. you got to have the knowledge to start out with and then set it into skill. And they have to have a really good understanding of the birds they're working with, their breed, yeah. their breed of choice, which you'd be surprised. We've been saying that a lot lately. That if you look at the breeders out there, the most common ones, the most popular ones, the ones people are always talking about when they're buying birds, they're supposed to be the experts, but they don't even know their own breed. They have no idea the proper makeup, the structure. They know the purpose for which the breed is bred for, but they really don't understand the bird itself. Replicators. Yeah, replicators. <laughs> Multipliers. Replicators. Yep. They put a bunch of hens in a pen with a cock. And whatever comes of it is what comes of it. And that's what they usually sell. 
I have selective breeding here, but I'm going to cover that later. But patience and persistence. And you need that because you're going to run into times when things just don't go right. The birds don't turn out like you thought. And that's one of the things the Breeders Academy and the Founders Program shows you that when you run into snags, it shows you why you ran into that snag. That snag actually could be what you should be expecting. People will get certain results and not understand the results and just think it was a failure. If you understand the breed, you understand the breeding, you understand the program, then you understand that you're probably right where you should be. And if we look at the first few stages of the Founders Program, which is a cleanup process, you'll realize really quick that which seems like it's not the right place is exactly where you should be. It's telling you exactly what you want to know. So you got to be patient. You got to be persistent and you got to work yourself through the problem. Yeah. You hit the nail on the head, Kenny, because if they're going through the cleanup process and say something wild happens, something comes up. By them knowing their birds and the back history of them, when that stuff starts popping up, it's going to take a lot of the mystery out of what it is. It's going to allow them to stick to the method that they're doing and know that, okay, this wasn't my fault. This is the reason this happened. That's so big because a lot of times the first bad thing that happens in the breeding program, they ditch it or worse, they add outside blood. Yeah, they give up too early. They don't realize that what they're seeing is a lot of times what they should be seeing at that stage. Mark is bringing up a good one here. To breed well is necessary to know the basic principles of game fowl genetics or any genetics, no matter what breed, no matter whether it's domestic chickens, whether it's game fowl, whether it's cattle, pigs, no matter what, you really do need to know the genetics so that when you're looking at genetic factors of those traits, then you can properly select and know the principles of game fowl genetics, selection and breeding process. So we say that all the time. How are you going to select properly and run them through the breeding program if you don't really understand the genetics? Because you cannot select properly if you don't know the genetics. Most no. of the time, without knowing the genetic factors of those traits, you're just guessing. And it's one of the reasons they're not getting the results they think they should be getting. What if I could go in to your mind and white blank of all the genetic information that's in your brain right now and then say, okay, Kenny, start from scratch and make this a family. Give you a cotton hen and say, make this a family. One minute. You're going to be there for a while. A lot of people think that I just came into this and knew all the answers right away. Everything yeah. I'm seeing from our members, our followers, and everybody online, all the things I say, I totally understand why they say the, what they say. Because I was there too. I was right where they were. I did the same things they were doing. I made the same choices they made. I looked at selection like they did. The way they think today... I thought the same way for the longest time. It wasn't until I met certain people like Tony and Doug and a number of other of my members that really woke me up. And between how good their birds and the results they were getting and what they were teaching me, which made completely sense, I put it into practice. It worked for me. They didn't want to teach it. I did. Started seeing the results in other people's birds. So I've been where these guys were. I know exactly what they're talking about. I know what they're thinking. I know what they're going through. I learned. And that's what we're trying to teach everybody else. From what I've been seeing just on Facebook this week with the different Facebook pages is unfortunately people do not know what they do not know. That's right. Yeah. And it makes me sad because I really want to help them because I'm on their page being respectful to them. I don't post just join the Breeders Academy and you'll learn everything you need to know. So I, I just hope that they find us someday. Yeah, Nancy was talking to me about that today. And she used to always say they seem like they need help. They got questions. I was looking at this one page and this young guy was having some issues. And I think he was getting frustrated because I think people were giving him a hard time. It wasn't really helping him. He was getting upset. And I think he was praising some of them that were actually willing to help. I remember even seeing Frank get in there and say, hey, hang in there, guy. It gets better. And Nancy's like, why don't you give them help? But I go, that's someone else's page. I don't like jumping into someone else's page and give advice because I feel like I'm crossing the line. That's their page. And I feel like if they need information from me, I think they know where to find me most of the time. And then I'll help them there. And I especially help them inside the Breeders Academy. But I try to be respectful of other people's pages. Some people are going to take what I give them and like it. Some are going to take offense of it. I'm going to come off like a know-it-all to some people. You just never know what you're going to get. And then I know the people on my page are following me for a reason, and they're open to what I'm going to teach them. So that's where I try to stay. In that scenario, though, Kenny, in that type 
environment, you've got to let them come to you. I hate to say it that way. I really do. It has to be their decision. Yeah, but speaking of Frank, I did read his post to this one person this week, and he was very uplifting and encouraging to him. And, and I feel like there's never enough of that. And I gave him a thumbs up. He was telling the guy, just hang in there. It's going to be okay. And with that being said, it's not telling him, okay, first you start here and do this and this and that, and then follow me because I'm going to tell you exactly what to do next and to do that and that and that. He didn't go there. He was just giving him, <laughs> you guys are laughing at me. He was just giving him encouragement that it's okay. You can do this and it can be done. And other people have been in the same place that you've been in. I appreciate that about Frank is he's so kind to other people. Not everybody would say that. I don't think, Nancy. <laughs> There'd be a few out there that would say the opposite, would argue with you on it. But also I, I told him a lot of these guys that get on there, that's know-it-alls that he was talking about, that he was calling the a-holes. Basically, they see somebody new, they want to pounce on them and make them look foolish, ridicule them. And I, I bet you anything, I bet any amount of money you want to bet, if you sit down with that guy and give him a one-on-one -on -one with chickens, he probably knows less than the guy that he's ridiculed. It's yeah. like the big drunk guy at the bar, all mouth, running his mouth. A lot of times, they're nothing. The quietest man in the room usually is the one that you need to look out for. See, and it's the same way with anything else. Yeah. I run into two things when I do that. When I give my advice on other people's pages, some are like, oh, Kenny's there. Let me ask him a question. And it becomes a, a never-ending Q&A that I, I can't get away from. Or it's me just arguing back and forth with people that just want to criticize and have a problem with everything you say. So then what's my other resource? is to what, post my website on there or my pages or my show, then I feel like I'm overstepping because I'm promoting my stuff on other people's pages. I don't like to do that. So I like the old saying, when the student's ready, the teacher appears. And I believe what Frank says, when they need me, they're going to find me. And if they're willing to be open to what I'm going to teach them, then we're good and I'll help them. But I mostly do that on the website these days. It's like the old saying, you can take a horse to water, but you can't force him to drink. That's true. Yes, Joseph, this was the issue I was having today when I was talking it over with Kenny is when you see folks seeking the correct help, you encourage them to continue. Many don't even know what information to seek or how to ask about it. Yeah. In, that, in that term, they don't know what they don't know. You would think it's just the beginners. It's not just the beginners. That's true. It's the so-called experts and the people have been doing this for a long time. It's amazing what they don't know that they don't know. I learned something new. If I go looking for it, I can learn a bunch of stuff every day, okay? Yeah. Whether it's on nutrition, breeding, concerning a chicken. If I go looking for it, I can educate myself more every day I go looking for it. And I think anybody can. I don't care how much knowledge you got. If you go looking for it, you can learn something every day of your life if you want to. I want to say is the first thing that comes to my mind is find the right mentor. Man, that is so hard to do because some people, the advice they're giving isn't really that good because they don't know what they don't know. That should have been the title of today's show. It's usually stuff that, that they've not even been taught, that they've seen other people sharing on Facebook. Now, is it the right information? Is it the wrong? I'm glad you brought that up, Kenny. That's another thing I told that kid. I said, make sure not to learn from everybody. Find one guy that you think that is a good, honest breeder Get him to help you. Don't learn from everybody. If you learn from everybody, you're walking down a path that you never want to go. It will take him longer to get rid of the not true facts, the old wives' tales and superstitions. Once you get those in there, it's hard to get them back out. I've been there and done that. And it's hard to get rid of those and go down a path to where science and fact. But once you get started on that path, you never come back off that path because you know the rest of it's garbage. It's like whoever you decide to learn from. And I did this too, even with Tony and some of the other mentors. It wasn't like I was testing their knowledge. Is that they would always say something to me that make me question some stuff. So I would do my research. And back then, there was no internet. Or the internet that was around wasn't even that good. So I would get whatever books I could, whatever information I could. I would take what they taught me and take it farther. And I could see from what they taught me, some of it was right. Some of it was in the ballpark, and then it was a handful of things that were just still wrong. So I would take what they taught me and learn more. 
and then put it into practice. And then I would go to someone else that I respect it and I would learn even more. I would say, no matter who you're learning from, no matter who your mentor is, do your research and see if you can learn a little more and find out whether that's true or not. Because you might find that what they're saying is close, but maybe not exactly right. But then you can learn a little more and take it to the next level. And that opens up other doors, other opportunities. And before you know it, you're moving from this subject to this subject to that subject. And before you know it, you're a well-rounded breeder. And that's what I did. It was never enough just to take someone's word for something. I had to research it and learn more. And then that opened up other things. It's like I learned a lot of selective breeding practices, which opened the door to evolutionary biology, believe it or not, which evolutionary biology covers a lot of things. It covers evolution, which is a big area to learn, which you'll realize that a lot of evolution, a lot of the mechanisms of evolution resemble sector breeding. That also opens the door to genetics. And once you understand genetics and realize how that works, and that you can't really select your birds properly without understanding genetics. Jameson's got it figured out. Nancy, if you want to read that one, that's a good one. Frank, learning from everybody is mongrel knowledge that will need extensive cleaning up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That's a good way to put it. And, and that's basically what happens. But you was talking about there wasn't any internet, Kenny, back when we was coming up. Uh, the closest thing we had to the internet was the Gamecock magazine. That's the closest thing we had to the internet right there, usually, yeah. or dead man books or some old poultry books. That's all we had. And even those were hard to come by. And not everybody could get them. But one of my mentors, he wasn't really a mentor. He was just a real good breeder. And he was old school as he could be. When I would ask him those tough questions on why this needs to be done, when I get him stumped and in a corner, he'd always say, that's the way God made it. That's the way Mother Nature made it. He didn't know how to explain it, so he would get out of it by, that's just the way it is. But he never could tell me exactly the scientific way, and he'd always have that loophole of, that's just the way the good Lord made it, or that's just the way it is. That's where best of the best comes from, too, by the way. Yeah, true. But I was in FFA when I was a kid, and it was just lucky happenstance. I'm telling you. I think back at how that happened. When I was in there, they had all the old dead man books from earlier classes, like from the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and they had them all on the table, and they were just giving them away to the students. Nobody wanted them. It was so funny. I just started scooping them up. I started scooping one of each of them. I had a whole stack of them, and I took them home on the livestock breeding and poultry husbandry, you name it. And as a kid, even as Nancy, when we first got married, I was always sitting opening all those books and reading through them all the time. I can't remember a time that I wasn't at least opening one and looking at it. And this was back when I was playing professional golf. eBay came on the scene. And I remember buying a lot of books from eBay at that time. And then I remember Amazon came on shortly after that, and I started finding books there. But you've seen my library, Frank. It's huge. Mm -hmm. Okay? And I don't buy as many books as I used to, but there was a time I was buying a book here and there, and I couldn't read them fast enough. I'm learning from them. And every time I opened a book, it was like a wow factor. It was like, oh my God, this is cool. And then put it into practice, check it out, start seeing results. Between my results and my students' results, became set in stone when it came to what I taught. And then I started doing the seminars. It was cool. How cool is it to actually research something, okay? Take it in, read it several times to where you understand it in total, just the way the members do in the Breeders' Academy. And then you put it to use and you see it evolving the way that you read it. Now, that's the awesome side of it is once you get all that knowledge from those books and then you see it appearing right before your very eyes and it all working together, that's what gives it that wow factor. That's when that light bulb comes on over your head. That's what puts everything in perspective. And then when you see that happening, then those old wise tales and those old stories that was handed down by generations, count the scales on the legs, that sort of thing, you no longer have those in your mind. They have no room for that in your breeding whatsoever. There's a number of different key things I learned that pretty much wiped out all the old wives' tales that we've been hearing all these years when it came to breeding game fowl. And one, Frank and I was talking about, I think it was last week, that there's some people that they pretty much follow us on everything, but there's a handful of things that they just cannot 
get themselves to accept. And one of them is that there's no correlation between color and performance ability. And that was something we've heard for a long time. And I know why it's so ingrained in people's mind and why they just can't let it go and why that phrase or that idea just never went away. And there's three things that make it go away pretty fast once you do the research. It won't sound like three things the way I'm explaining it. Let me say it. Meiosis, sex linkage, or link genes, that is, and independent assortment of genes, which is Mendel's second law. So if you look at meiosis, you look at how the creation of gametes, you take the traits of the mother and father, and you combine them. Then they split off, and through crossover, it creates variation. Basically, you're recombinating whatever genes are there. And then those genes, how they line up on the chromosomes is dependent on whether they're correlated and if they're passed together. Color and performance ability not, are not only correlated, they're not passed together. They're also polygenic traits, which are determined by multiple genes. So you can see why they're not passed together. And then if we look at Mendel's law of independent assortment of genes, that basically shows you that everything we thought about meiosis is true. And so once I started learning meiosis, Mendel's law of independent assortment of genes, gene linkage, then I realized that this idea of correlation, especially the correlation that people think that they're getting, doesn't work. So once I understand that and start teaching it, it started changing people's mind. And we are changing the trend, Frank. It's getting better and better. And if we keep doing this, there's going to be some people just ain't going to let it go are going to be left behind. Well... That's what I keep telling everybody that thinks they can breed hybrid birds and still pass on the traits that those birds is holding. And that's what I tell them. I said, listen, the only thing you got to do is study meiosis. And I promise you, that proves your fact that, oh, white birds are no good. Black birds are no good, you know, depending on the color. And that explains it all in a nutshell. Just what you mentioned right there. That's all they've got to educate themselves on pretty much as the meiosis part. And that debunks all of it. And the other one was, when you look at meiosis, the independent assortment of genes and gene linkage, the idea, like Frank said, is you have a family, you feel like they're pure, you've been breeding them pure for a long time, you add new blood to refresh in them, thinking you're going to breed those genes, those bad genes, back out again over time to where they're pure again. When you look at meiosis, the independent assortment of genes and gene linkage, you realize that doesn't work either. All you did, recombinate the genes and change the family forever. So there's certain things that we've been clinging on all this time that with a little bit of knowledge of science, a little bit of knowledge of genetics, a little bit of evolutionary biology and the mechanisms of evolution, how they resemble selective breeding, we realize almost all the old wives' tales we've been clinging to, and I still hear them today, it drives me nuts, they're not true. None of it works like they think it does. And they just keep talking to each other like it's a real thing when it's not. It's the blind leading the blind. They're not learning a damn thing. The greatest thing I ever done was got involved in studying genetics and a proper breeding program. That right there set me up to where I wasn't only raising chickens anymore. I was actually doing the breeding. And that opened my eyes up so much, guys. Read it to hear it. To study it is one thing, but to put it into a skill and actually use it and you see the results from it, it's an eye opener. The science part of it proves to you that it all works. You don't have to guess and say, I hope this works out. You're seeing it as it's happening. You don't have to guess or hope. You see the whole process of it. And so many people out there, Kenny, since we're on the meiosis, they're breeding these hybrid birds, expecting for a miracle, and it won't happen. Yes, you can take those hybrids and make a good strain out of them, but using a proper breeding program, like the founder's program. But you just can't breed cross birds over and over again and expect a good outcome. You can't do it. At some point, you're going to have to add blood to them. At some point, if you don't any know any way of around it, but if you've got a good breeding program, you're slitting the way you need to be, and you've got the knowledge on how to do it, you can take a family and keep them until your deathbed and never have to add any blood to them if you know what you're doing. That's a fact. The ones that get me the most is when they say, for our birds, genetics doesn't work. You don't need to know about genetics. You don't need to know about confirmation of body. Those are for pretty birds. That one just cracks me up. It's always the things they don't want to learn 
or actually advance their knowledge or take the time to learn properly that they just want to mark it off as those are for pretty birds. That just gets me. And like Frank was saying, whenever you cross birds, let's say you have a family that's fairly pure. They've been inbred enough to see some uniformity and you bring them together. And then it's a cross. I get that. But we're not dealing with very many crosses these days. We're actually dealing with mongrelization because when you do a cross, breed two pure birds, you get hybridization. When you breed three or more different bloodlines together, now you got mongrelization. Okay. I know that upsets people, but it's true. And it's not that it's a bad thing. It is if you're trying to create a family or trying to maintain a family, it's a real bad thing. But as far as mongrelization, can you select birds as seed fowl from mongrel stock? Yeah. If they represent their breed, have the traits you're looking for, they don't have any serious defects, they're not sick, they have the right type and conformation, those are good specimens as seed fowl to create a strain. And then you just have to match them properly to a bird that has the same breed characteristics and color so that you're not fighting your way through it. Because the closer they are, the better it's going to be to create a strain from. I know the cleanup process of the Founders Program works pretty good, but when you've got two birds that are from different breeds or different varieties, that cleanup process is going to take a while. I always try to tell people that, yes, you can find good birds and bad birds from a good breeder. You can find good birds and bad birds from a predator if you know what you're looking for. That's the key. When you were talking about how people... Like, I'm just going to add some new blood for a season or two, and then I'm going to breed it out. Explain to me how you breed out the genetics. I know what they think is when they don't see them anymore, it becomes recessive, and then and they don't see them. No, no. Okay, here's how they see it. They think they have a pure family. They start thinking they're running into problems. Usually, right. they're more worried about inbreeding than anything else, or they see issues. Instead of working through the issue, they think they need to add new blood. So they go to their friend. They find blood they think is better than theirs. They breed them in. Then they breed the offspring back to their birds. Generation after generation, like in a backcrossing situation, I don't even want to call it line breeding, to the point when they start getting some kind of uniformity, they think they bred it out, which they didn't. It's still there, especially the recessives. Those hidden recessives just don't go away. But in the meantime, they eliminate many of the homozygous dominant genes that they need it. Okay, and because the birds were somewhat of the same variety, they think they got away with it, which they didn't. And then once they start getting them uniform again, then they do it all over again. They add new blood and do the process all over again. So I can see why they see it that way. I can see why they think that works, but we know through science. They add outside blood. They make one cross with their birds. Okay, this is what I see. Say, for instance, Kenny's got out-and-out out Kelsos. I got out-and-out out Kelsos. Oh, okay. We're playing the name game, all okay. right? <laughs> they think, mine's going downhill, but I need to freshen them up a little bit. I go get one of Kenny's birds, I breed it to mine, and then they're freshened up. But they're still pure, out-and-out out Kelsos. That's how people think about it. But the only thing they done was make a cross. That's the only thing they done. Yeah, they may be out-and-out out Kelsos, what you call them, but if you've done DNA on those, they're not even related. They're nowhere even close being related unless you got them from the same farm, from the same breeder. And then maybe. Check out our episodes on the name game because that's a whole episode all by itself. That those names... I can even handle that. What's that? I can handle it to a certain point, the name game. I can understand it to a certain point to where somebody says, hey, I got some chickens that they were called on hatch. Then I've got some idea what kind of chicken they've got. I can handle it to that point. Are they really blue face? No. They never will be. They're gone. They're done for. But I can handle it in a conversation to where they're using it to explain to me what they have. I can handle that. Not to be opposite of you exactly. And I understand why you say that. I would have been more agreeable about that years ago. Because there was a time when I was younger that when someone said they had a hatch, they looked like a hatch. They weren't. Yeah. They did a good job, I mean, because they always bred to a certain type. When they said Kelso, they usually had a certain look about them. Clarets especially, they had a certain look about them. They had that winish red color with the white legs and the black spurs, and they were straight comb. Downheads, they had a certain look about them too. So we understood, and for a long time, it did seem like it was real. That's why we followed it. Man, you look on Facebook, or I judge a show, or I go to someone's farm, and they're mentioning all these different names. Frank, they don't resemble the types that we used to be familiar with. They're completely different now. They're just a mix-up of blood. I don't even know how they keep track of it because there's nothing 
that resembles those bloodlines that didn't exist then, but at least we bred them to resemble a certain type. They don't even do that yeah. anymore. Now, and that's what I tell everybody. One man's blue face is gold. Another man's blue face is junk. And then you bring them together and put them side by side, they don't look a thing alike. That's how I see it. That much. name is getting more people in trouble, more now today than the, before, than anything else I can think of. And because that name game doesn't work, it's not real, then the percentage game doesn't work either. Because if those names aren't real, then the percentage game can't work. Because all you're doing is mixing up blood, adding new blood, mongrelizing them even more. And any improvements or bump you think you're getting, it's just hybrid vigor. And it's very temporary. You can't pass hybrid vigor to the next generation. It's not inheritable. I seen a post there. It's been a couple of weeks back. Me and a buddy of mine was talking about it. And uh, it said, pure blue face hatch. And the hen and the cock was blue-legged. Dark blue-legged. And they was pure hatch and blue-legged. Go figure. Anybody knows how you get blue legs, then it's got a lot of white-legged blood in it to get the blues. Think about that. What's he saying, Nancy? You're 100% correct, Kenny. I can't even talk with my family about foul. They're stuck on hybrid vigor and the name game, half this, half that, but have no idea of what a true breeder actually is. Sam is right. Without that name game and the percentage game, these guys can't even talk to each other. That's the only way they're able to carry on the conversation. If you wipe that out, they wouldn't know what to say to each other. It's got better over time, but back 15 years ago, if you called a bird of yours something else other than what it's supposed to be in, say, a Kentucky Roundhead, they'd have crucified for saying, that's not what that is. You got them somewhere. What was the breed before you got them? Or you could say, okay, this is a breed that I made, and this is Colonel Gibbons' bloodline. And they had to choose. And the one that I made be five times the birds than the Colonel Gibbons, they'd go to Colonel Gibbons. Oh, yeah. I had that problem, too. Because I got to the point when my birds didn't resemble the Colonel Givens. Anybody I knew that had Colonel Givens, my bird looked nothing like him. I just selectively bred him. So I started calling the Maximus line. They just couldn't wrap their mind around it. And they would just keep digging. And I would just finally tell them, okay, I originally got them from Colonel Givens, but I'm going to flat out tell you, they're nothing like those birds anymore. They're like nobody else's Colonel Givens. And I just don't feel good about calling them Colonel Givens. I just can't play that game. And once I understood what the name game was all about, I really couldn't play it. Someone starts talking to me about different names. I can go along with it for a little bit in that I understand that's their understanding of that particular bird. It's like when I do coaching calls. Okay, I know you don't like the name game, but all I can tell you is this is what they were called when I got them, and this is where I am. Okay, I get that. That's a starting point. We can move on from there. We can at least start the conversation. But I make it very clear to them that you understand that once you start getting into the program, you start breeding them yourself. Now we got to move away from that name. Now they're yours. Because to continue using that name is a disservice to your birds and yourself. Think about it is, yes, yours was Colonel Gibbons. You got them from Colonel Gibbons. He was alive, still breeding birds. Kenny got them from him. Yes, when he got them home, they were still Colonel Gibbons. But here's the thing. When Kenny went past the seed foul that he got from Colonel Givens and started selecting his own birds and choosing the traits that he wanted those birds to have, to me, they're no longer Colonel Givens. They're Kenny Toronto's, whatever he calls them. Because the guy you got them from is not doing the selecting. He's not doing the breeding anymore. You are. So that makes them your birds, not some legendary big-time breeder name. That's how I see it. When I got him, he didn't call him Colonel Givens. He said, these are the old Harold Brown blood. But I didn't even call him that. That's where he got his Yeah, friend. that's yeah. what he told me. It's just the old Harold Brown blood. And for a while there, I did call him Colonel Givens, but I just saw them changing. Every time I saw someone's Colonel Givens, they were nothing like mine. And mine just continued to change. And everybody kept out. Even Tony would ask me, what'd you put in them? Like, why well, put anything in them? I just selectively <laughs> bred them to where they're at now. You know? That's funny. How many asking that, though? That's funny. Yeah, well, I, I had a conversation, what was it, six months ago, I was talking to Tony. And hanging on to some of the old wives tells himself a little bit. Tony, are we talking about the same thing? I can't believe you're saying that. And we're starting to get to the point where we weren't on the same page anymore. I don't, I'm a little confused about it, to tell you the truth. He's doing too many. He's moves, talking to too so many you, people. <laughs> he's going to too many UGBA meetings is what he's doing. 
I don't get it. He's like, oh, Tony, are we really talking about this? But the, the other one, Frank, is attention to detail. All the good breeders I know really paid attention to the big things, but the small things too. And those are the things that make the biggest difference. Because as long as you're breeding your family to represent their breed, but you pay attention to the small things, you make them your own, which is really cool. You make them unique without changing the breed. And the breeders, I know that I would call good breeders were able to do that. Everybody else thought they had to add new blood to get it. Yeah, and that's the reason I don't understand these guys. They go buy birds from people, some good, some bad. But even if they get good birds, they're constantly trying to make them just the way they are. They never try to improve them. They never try to put them on a path to where they're going up, being better. Say, for instance, even seed fowl. They just breed those over and over and over again until they die, and they never go forward with them. Yeah, because they spent $1,500 on that trio. I'm going to get the most I can out of that trio. I understand that. And, and I fought with Kenny about that before. I'm like, they spent so much money on these things. But then when he explained to me why you can't just keep going back to the mother and father, the Adam and Eve, I really get it now because you're just staying stagnant. You're not moving forward. Even if they only use them the one time and they spent yeah. $3,000 on them and they got off to a good start, then they did good. That's okay. worth it. It is worth it. And trying to get them to understand that is hard. And I get it. Like Nancy said, I totally understand their angst, that they spent so much money and they want to get the most out of it. If they bred the crap out of them and they got as many offspring as they could, so they got a good selection, they were able to move forward and create a family from that, then they did good. But we see it so many times. Nancy was talking to me about it today. You were asking me about breeding backwards, and you were asking why that's a big deal. And you were looking at some of the elements of the Founders Program, and I said, that's not breeding backwards. There's a reason why you do that. Breeding backwards is when you're working multi-generations, like in a cloning program, you're getting to a point of uniformity. You're actually making some progress. And then instead of taking them to the next step, you bring in blood from earlier, like the original brood fowl. Let's say they're getting old, you're getting all worried, you want to make sure you get the most of them, and you breed them right back into that family. You reintroduced all the genes you worked out you reintroduced all the defects that you eliminate it, and you start it completely over. And to me, that's breeding backwards. You never want to breed backwards. I see it all the time. They get to a point when they're making progress, and then they breed the original blood right back into them again, and they screw everything up. Yeah, It's okay to keep them for <clears throat> an insurance policy for a little bit. Hey, something happens. You never know. I could see that, but just what Kenny said, why would you go forward four or five years and then turn around and take the birds that you started with, your Adam and Eve, and breed them back into your family and just push everything back down to start over again, reset everything again. Like yeah. Kenny said, it's crazy. But this is what I think. If we explain that to them that way, then they get an idea of it and they know better. But I think a lot of times people does that without really thinking the process over or really even thinking in that way. Frank knows someone, and this was such a good idea when I heard it, I was like, wow, this is really good. He had a trio, paid good money for it. He got the family going. Once he was convinced that the family is on its way, he sold the original trio to someone else. And then they started their family with it. I love that idea. And he got his money back. Okay, got yep. his family started, made sure they were gone so he didn't reintroduce them into the family and resold them to someone else who was able to do the same thing. I thought that was such a, a great idea. I had a friend. That's what he wanted to do. He was in academy, and I sold him a pair of the yellow-legged birds. I got light reds, and he bred them, got his start. Then a buddy of his, a little there close, paid him what he he gave me for the birds, and he started them with. And then another guy after that used them to start his with. But here's the thing: they showed me pictures of those birds. That's been five, six years ago. All three of them look like totally different families. Mark has a fetish yeah. with cold beer. That's all I know. Every time I see him say something, it's always connected to cold beer. He says breeding game fowl is an art and a science at the same time. It requires knowledge, experience, and passion, and most important, cold beer. It is an art. It is a science. Understanding the difference between the two and how they're connected is really important. And yes, you need to have the knowledge and experience and the drive to make it all happen. I totally agree. And don't forget the cold beer. So, <laughs> If I added the cold beer to it, I would have mongrels. 
I'd be a breed and everything. Yeah, yeah I'd the, have the awful mess ever. The problem, <laughs> how much cold beer? Because if you're, like Frank says, yeah. if you drink too much beer, who knows what you're breeding together? Forget what hand you use. They put <laughs> a different wrong colors with uh, each other, everything. It's that would be me. Don't call when you're drunk. You're inevitably no. going to call the wrong bird. I actually think that cold beer is just to keep him steady so that he doesn't freak out when he sees a few duds out of his offspring or or in the way he's putting it here it's a celebration so there you go yes i remember those days i used to come home hard day after work get a cold beer out of the refrigerator long neck a lot of times it would bring tears to my eyes it tastes good but anymore i don't have that luxury yeah the last thing i want to talk about tonight and then we're going to move on to the back end would be adaptability they're willing to adjust their breeding strategies based on new information they're always willing to improve their knowledge of breeding, skills as a breeder, and their farm setup and management. And they're always looking for ways to improve their strength. So people need to be open-minded and willing to learn. And maybe realize what they've been taught all this time is wrong. Yeah. I put a post up there the other day, and I can't remember how it went. But it was pretty much people has been taught on hand-me-down stories but they've never researched it to see if it's facts or if it's not true. The thing is somebody can set you down and educate you, tell you how to do something, but how does that make them right? Research it. Somebody tells you something, research it. Even if it makes sense, research it and see if that's the actual truth. Yeah. I've had plenty of good mentors. People to help me down the road to give me some good information. But one thing I did because a lot of people back in my younger years, me and Kenny was talking about this last week, they would tell me stuff just to waste my time and get a good life out of it. So after that, even though they told me something it sounded logic, I would still research it before I would do it. You can never learn enough, and you can never improve your skills enough. There's always room for improvement, improving you, improving your fowl, improving your farm. Once you stop learning, you become stale. I feel like I know a lot. And I can help a lot of people, but I never stop learning. It's like anything, though. You rest, you take breaks. It's hard to get back in the groove of it again. And a lot of things will go hidden in your mind. If you're not using it every day or talking about it or staying with it, you'll lose some of it. It makes it easier when you do get back at it, though. It it starts coming back to you and using it. But Kenny said many times, once you learn it, it's there with you. It's like riding a bike. You may go five years without riding a bike and you're a little shaky when you first get on it, but you still remember the principles of it, how to do it. I think it's easier for me because I'm always creating new material. I'm always working on new things and I'm always working with our members and we're always doing new shows. So I'm not only refreshing and relearning or remembering everything I've learned, but I'm always learning new things too. So maybe it's easier for me because I just put myself in that situation where I have to constantly learn. How many times have you been talking with somebody, a coaching call, and they would say something or you would say something and it'd be like something switch and you'd like, oh, I remember that now. Something that you had forgotten way, way back and it was still in your mind. It's just that you needed something to bring it to the surface. And you'd be like, oh, yeah, I remember that. I woke up in the middle of the night and say, yes. (laughs) And then I was like, what in the world is wrong with you? Oh, I just remembered something. Sorry. (laughs) No, that happens to me all the time. Ask Nancy. Her and I talk all the time and things will just pop in my head or Nancy will say something a certain way. I'm like, oh crap, write that down. Or Tani and I, Tani and I will be talking. I'll be driving the car, go write that down. Or like you said, I'll be doing a coaching call and I'll either remember something that I had forgotten or something will pop in my head and make me want to research something. Or something Mm -hmm. totally new. I've done that so many times, just talking to people about breeding chickens in general. And it would bring up something like, ooh. I think that's a good idea. And you try it, and it was a good idea. I'm always digging into science a little deeper and a little deeper. And it's like Brian Reeder. He was teaching me some things that I never heard before, but it was like a constant wow factor. Oh, wow. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, yeah, now I get that. Yeah, I've seen that before. I didn't understand why that happened. Now that makes sense. I love that feeling of learning something new. It's like a lightning bolt. I can't explain the feeling when I learn something new. Useful. I was too. talking to one of my friends and I've been trying to figure out some stuff on nutrition and we weren't even talking about nutrition. We were just talking about chickens, messaging to each other like me and you do, Kenny. And all of a sudden he said one word and it was just like it all opened up and laid out for me. I know exactly what I needed to do. 
And we weren't even talking about nutrition. So it will come to you when you least expect it a lot of times. Yeah. Joseph said light bulb moments. Yeah. Exactly. We haven't even barely dug into this outline today, but it turned out to be a really good conversation. But the outlines are like that, where I'm putting together information, I'm creating a topic, I'm creating some bullet points that I wanted to talk about that has a, something to do with that particular topic. And it just brings up things. Now, some things are in my head that just come out all the time because they're that important. And it'll seem like I talk about some things more than others, or I talk about some things a lot. Repetition. Repetition. And I do think it's that important. Okay. It's my way of saying, hey, open your mind. This is a big deal. Take it seriously. Implement it. Some things are a big deal and they're associated with a lot of other things. Like we talked about, meiosis sounds simple to some people, but it's a huge factor when it comes to breeding and understanding the results you're going to get. That's connected to a lot of things. Mitochondrial DNA is connected to a lot of things. It seems simple, but once you understand mitochondrial DNA, understand how to select for it, the benefits of it, the results you're going to get, man, that stuff sticks with you forever. And you practice it properly, you're going to see big results. So there's some yeah, things that's a make or break. Time. Yeah, it, it really it's a is. make or break. Yeah, it is. And you'll learn all those terms inside the Breeders Academy. Yep, for sure. Was there anything we want to talk about, or anything we want to mention or say before we go to the back end and start talking to our members? We got a really good topic on the back end. Clone worthy. How do you know if the bird is worth cloning? That's a much asked question. It'll be a fun one to talk about. We had two questions, but they're not related to our show topic. If we're out of time, we're out of uh, time. If they're members, ask them inside the website. We're way over time today, or come back next week and ask us then. One of them we would have, had, one of the questions we would have had to uh, answer in the back anyway. Okay. So, but yeah. this has become a really good topic, and I still have the eight topics that we didn't even dive into yet. So, we're going to cover those next week this is a really good outline it's gonna be a fun one especially when we get into embracing the science that's a fun one so we'll talk about there those you go guys time. he says join the breeders academy and boost your iq <laughs> <laughs> thanks lee i appreciate Love that it. yeah Love. that's cool okay so thank you guys for joining me thank you for contributing to the comments and the questions and it's a good show did good so yeah. we'll, we'll see you guys next week Bye. see you guys okay thanks for listening Yes, thank you again for joining us on the Breck Perfection Podcast Show. This show was brought to you by the Breeders Academy, where by becoming a member, you can increase your knowledge of breeding, advance your skills as a breeder, and take you and your fowl to the next level. We can also show you how to create a strain from hybrid crosses or mongrel flocks and help you to create, maintain, and improve your present strains. We urge you to check it out. You have nothing to lose and you can cancel anytime. To join us at the Breeders Academy membership website, go to www.breedersacademy.com. Best of all, I'll be there to help you every step of the way. While you're checking out the Breeders Academy, make sure to sign up for our newsletter, The Breeders Bulletin. We provide a lot of free bonus materials and some great information that will take you and your file to the next level. Well, that's it for now. We hope you join us next time for another episode of Bread to Perfection. We'll see you later. Bye.